Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to introduce myself uh, too much because I think we have enough to talk about today. My name is Sebastian. I work for the Ordina Pythoneers, and that's it. So let's talk about security. Um, I have two disclaimers to make for this talk, and they are important. So first of all, um, if you've seen one of my previous talks, they were highly technical. And when I'm doing a technical talk, I try to stick to the facts, to uh, what you could say the objective truth, if you believe in such a thing. Well, not today. Today I'm here to talk about security. And while I do like to cite my sources, I'm also going to give my opinion and my perspective, my perspective on security. This means that you may disagree with me. This means that you may have a different perspective than I have. Um, and that's fine. Uh, um, and I think that's good. So if you do have a different opinion, if you do have a different perspective, I invite you to come talk to me after this talk. Uh, we can have a nice conversation and maybe I can learn something today. Uh, so that's the first disclaimer. And the second one is that I am not a security specialist. I do like security. I do love security. I do try to advocate for security. I do t uh, try to champion security. But at the heart, at my heart, I'm a developer. Uh, I'm a Python developer who just is very interested in security. So that's the second disclaimer. Uh, so you don't have to believe anything I say today. Don't trust me. Check your own sources. Uh, but I hope to inspire you to do that. Um, well, I think those are uh, enough disclaimers for one talk. So let's jump into it. Uh, the main question that I want to answer today, and it might seem a little bit ridiculous, is why are developers so important for security? Well, this may seem like, like a very obvious question with a very obvious answer. Aren't developers the one developing most of the projects that we work on? Aren't developers the one writing most of the code that we write? So if developers write insecure code, how are those projects going to be secure? That seems fairly obvious, right? Well, not everyone seems to agree. If you listen to a lot of security specialists, they will actually tell you that no, developers are not that important for security. They don't mean that developers uh, uh, should not be important for security, but what they actually mean is that they think that most developers don't care enough about security. So they don't actually do enough security, so that's why they're typically not that important for the security of most applications and projects and large systems. In fact, I was reading a security article a couple of months ago, and it had this very interesting quote. You know how it goes. Mention security to your typical developer, and you're likely to be met with an eye roll, or at best, or puzzlement at worst. Generally, the whole security thing is seen as someone else's problem. I mean, that's a quote. If you have that in your article, people are going to remember your article. Now, this isn't even something taken out of context, because the header just above this quote says, developers don't love security, yet. So the security specialist here re is really trying to make a point. Well, my first reaction as a developer was, well, I do care about security. I do think that security is important. And most of the developers that I talk to also say that they find uh, security important. So why does this security specialist, and he's not the only one, if you go to security conferences, if you listen to talks and panels, uh, there are many security specialists who make similar comments. Why do they think this? Why do they think that developers don't really care about security? Is it because they don't really care? I'm not so sure. Or is it because of the way developers behave? And this goes back to uh, a new paradigm in security. It's been here for about five to 10 years. It's the shift left paradigm. Um, they use a caricature of the past. They say that, well, we used to do security very late in the process, which has a lot of issues because you don't consider security in your design, in your, you don't code securely from the start. So let's shift all that to the right. In fact, we shouldn't shift to the, uh, to the right, to the left. In fact, we shouldn't shift to the left, we should start at the left. We should consider security throughout the entire software development lifecycle. And that includes developers. Um, but what they see is that, be that developers don't behave as if they care about security. So why don't they? Why don't developers behave as if they care about security? I think to answer this question, uh, we actually need, uh, need to take a step back. If you continue past the quote in the article, he will tell you, well, it's because developers only focus on features. They only focus on experimenting with new innovations. They only care about delivering the project on time. Um, they don't really uh, prioritize security at the code level. Um, I think that's true, 
But I don't think that developers are to blame for that. I think to, to answer this question, we need to take a step back and think about what are developers paid to do? Well, if you think about it, your employer doesn't pay you to have fun. You might have fun, hopefully you're having fun, hopefully you like your job, but not, they're not paying you for that. They're paying you to deliver business value. They really want you to deliver something for the company or they want to make sure that the service they provide is better. If they're a non-profit company or a governmental company, they want you to deliver on your projects. In fact, those projects get started not because they want to have a project with great security, because they but because they have a problem to solve. So the focus around the project is typically on delivering the features, on delivering the project, on developing that new AI model or delivering that new machine learning model that they can use to do something. And in fact, uh, if you want to change this, you don't start with the developers, you need to include them, but what you actually need to change is the culture. Because everyone around the developers, most of them also care about the features and the project. If you talk to product owner, project manager, regular manager, uh, they're mostly concerned with the purpose of the project for the business. So everyone focuses on that. So in fact, what we can do is we can look to another area, the area of industrial safety, and there they have a very good understanding of what needs to change in, a, in, an, uh, in an organization. What they are promoting for the most part is a safety culture. Um, and what they mean by that is sure, you can uh, implement barriers in your industrial processes. You can analyze the parts of your airplane so it doesn't crash down. Uh, you can follow all the regulations. You can make sure that you follow all the guidelines for your permit. Um, you can have inspectors. But what's really important for your company is that you develop a safety culture where everyone wants things to be safe. That you're proactive, that you're not just following the rules, checking all of all the boxes in your checklist, but that you really invested in getting that safety culture going. Uh, and this is really important. If you don't do this in industry, it might mean a company ending disaster. So about 10 years ago, we had a big accident here in the Netherlands. It was uh, Chemipak, which was a company handling chemicals. Um, and they were not too strict on their safety culture or safety in general. So what eventually happened, they took too many risks, took too many shortcuts, and the place blew up. The company doesn't exist anymore. Uh, in fact, the entire environment there is still contaminated. They're cleaning it up uh, uh, even this day. Um, so this company doesn't uh, exist because they didn't have a proper safety culture. Now, in security, we also have a similar thing. It's called a security culture. And this is not by accident. Obviously, the fields of safety and security have a lot in common. And one thing is that if you truly want to promote security, you need to have a good culture in place. That developers uh, uh, um, can get to work on security, that product owners understand that it's important, that managers understand that it's important. And not only in name, but it actually takes effort uh, to do this right. But unfortunately for us, even if you have a major accident in security in IT, it typically doesn't lead to a company ending a disaster. So if you take LastPass here, which is a password manager, um, they had a security vulnerability, a string of data breaches into the core of their uh, core domain. What they tell you is give us your passwords, we keep them safe, you have the, the, the master key, uh, key uh, password, uh, and you can use your passwords everywhere. They were struck by a series of data breaches and they are still in business today. This wasn't a company ending disaster. And in fact, most consumers, they've already forgotten ab about these breaches. They're actually veering up, they're actually continuing. Now, I cannot look inside of LastPass. I don't know what the, the, the primary cause was, if it was a bad safety uh, security culture. Uh, but what you can tell is even if you have a breach within the core of your business, your company will probably turn out fine. And this is why regulatory bodies are stepping in. They're uh, introducing big fines for data breaches to provide companies with that incentive to spend time on security. Now, this is all very important, but what can developers do about it? So why are the developers so important for security? Well, the only way that we can really make room for security in our projects is if we argue for it. So in software development, we have a lot of non-functional requirements. 
And if you're a developer, especially a developer with experience, maybe some seniority, you, you think that a lot of those fun non-functional requirements are very important. You argue for maintainability, you argue for writing tests, you argue, uh, argue for loose coupling, uh, you want your software to be changeable, maintainable in the future, uh, so that your company can react to market changes rapidly. So we, as developers, typically argue a lot for those kind of things in our projects. Um, and in fact, if you believe uh, um, uh, Uncle Bob, as he's called, in his books he writes that this, you, this didn't used to be the case in the past, but we've seen a long development, and now nearly all developers write unit tests, integration tests, they care about their code quality, so we really argue for this. Now, if you go back to security, most developers say they care about security, that they think it's important, but they don't invest a lot of time in it. They don't argue uh, as strongly about it. They hope that there are security specialists within the organization that gives them guidelines for how to write secure software, but they don't come up with uh, those guidelines themselves. They, they don't do the research and they don't argue to, as strongly for it. So if we want to change the culture, and we as developers cannot do it on our own, but at the very least we can start arguing for security. But if you think about it, that's kind of difficult. Because I as a developer, when I started, was coding for, for, well, almost a decade, I hadn't learned that much about security. And it almost sounds as if you have to be a security expert if you uh, uh, want to improve that culture. So how are you going to do that? Now, so you either have to spend 10 years becoming an expert, but then you're no longer a development specialist. We are, most of us here, I think, developers or AI developers, machine learning uh, engineers. Um, so we cannot become an expert in all fields. So how are we going to do this? Well, luckily enough, there's a kind of a gap like Chekhov's gun over there. And obviously you've already realized that you don't have to be a security expert to contribute to security, and you don't have to be an expert to promote a security culture. So how can you do that? Well, most security specialists, most security experts, they are very vocal. They like to educate people. They write a lot of materials about security, they publish them online, uh, and they're there for you to learn from. You don't have to be an expert to do some reading. And another thing that security specialists like, what they like a lot, is they like checklists, maturity lists where they can measure the security within an organization. I think that's really good, because if you don't, can't measure something, you cannot measure if it improves. But if you take such a checklist, and you see all those activities that indicate a good security culture, you can also use it as a guideline for the things that you're missing as a developer. So you can look at those maturity models, you can look at those activities and think, hey, I'm not doing that, I can do that. Um, so that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my talk on. I'm going to introduce you to a few of those models, or actually one, and a few security principles, and I'm going to tell you how you can dive into security, how you can get started. Um, this isn't enough to make you, uh, uh, um, how do you say, fluent in the language of security. That's something that you can all do. I'm not going to give you a lecture taking you past all the parts in the model. Um, I don't think that makes sense. I think you can all Google and read on your own. But I am going to give you or lend you a hand in getting started. So first of all, um, what's the current situation? Well, there's an important term in um, security and it's defense in depth. And what this means is, if you see this, this castle here, is that you don't want one barrier between the outside and the inside, because if there's a hole in that single barrier, then someone gets in. So if you have a castle, you have a moat to get past, you have a wall to get past, there are probably guards. Uh, and even if you're inside of the courtyard, the most valuable things are inside of the castle there, so you really have to make it into that fortified castle as well. And obviously all the windows are very narrow, there are guards everywhere, so there isn't one layer of defense stopping you from getting in. This also means that if you think about it, uh, that it isn't enough to build a very strong outer wall. This is what a lot of companies are doing by necessity. They, they hire uh, another company to provide them with a platform where you can deploy your containers or they use AWS or, or Azure and they hope that the security on the outside is strong enough uh, because the developers, well, the code isn't always that secure. 
But the problem with that is that if you have barriers, there are probably holes in it. Now, this is another thing learned from industrial safety. This is the Swiss cheese model. It was first introduced by uh, James Reason in the 90s. And basically what he says is that if you have a disaster or an accident or a breach in, in, in our uh, case, then, you, then from the cause to the breach, there are typically multiple barriers that stop the, the, the breach. But typically, there are also holes in those layers. That's why it's a Swiss cheese model. If those holes line up, then you end up with a disaster. Now, an important difference with security, uh, uh, if you compare it to safety, is in safety, uh, uh, the, the causes are typically not intentional. In security, you have someone who's out there trying to find those holes, trying to make them match up to get past your barriers. So you need to be even more hypervigilant about the holes that you have. Um, so that's one, th one, one difference between safety and security. And there's, uh, but there's another aspect that we do need to take in mind. Not all the holes are just vulnerabilities that are present. Uh, that's what you could call latent conditions, things that were already there and then someone discovers it or a government is hogging some zero day vulnerability that no one knows about. So it's there and someone can use it to get past your firewall or whatever. Uh, but you also have active failures. And this in security is also really important. If you're coding someone, assume that your users are going to mess up, that someone is getting their two-factor authentication dialogue and that they simply press yes uh, while they're not even logging in. That's why these days you have to type in a number that prevents you from just typing yes if a hacker is trying to log in and just hoping that someone will press yes. So we also have active failures. It's something that you need to take into account. Well, anyway, this is the Swiss cheese model. Uh, I really like this book by James Reason. It's about industrial safety, but uh, there's a lot in here about safety culture and organizations. So if you do want to check that out, if you do want to read more about it, check out this book. Uh, but how can you do this in, in, in security? How can you prevent holes in your projects? It's actually not that difficult. I think there are three main pillars that we as developers should put some time uh, into. The first is learn secure design principles. A lot of developers, they think about architecture patterns, uh, they think about uh, uh, um, uh, things like design patterns for, the, for their code, they think about writing clean code, writing tests, but also take some time to learn about secure design principles in your code. A lot of them are obvious, you probably already know a lot, but do uh, take some time to dive into it further. The second is adopt mature security practices. Take a maturity model, dive into it, see what you're already doing, what you're lacking, and try to adapt a few new ones. And the third is, know how to mitigate common vulnerabilities. You've all heard of SQL injection, I hope. Uh, you've probably all, you're probably all using techniques to avoid it, parameterization, maybe an ORM framework that does it for you. Uh, but there are many more vulnerabilities, learn about them, and not just by name, but dive into them and learn how to mitigate them. So, the, the uh, secure design principles, there are a lot. That's what the cards indicate. This is just a random selection. Um, I'm not going to go into most of them because you can learn about them on your own. But I just wanted to show you there are a lot of secure design principles. Know them, use them, and practice with them. If you don't practice with them, you're probably not going to think about it when you're actually coding. There's one that I want to focus on in particular. It's the no unless one or deny by default. And why? Because I've reviewed a couple of projects, and in most projects, this is the one uh, that I see going wrong. So say, you ha you say you're working in Flask or in Django, you're making a, an endpoint, you're, you're having a view, then the typical mode of Django and Flask, they're very beginner friendly, is you just map a route to your view function or your view class, and things get served. So this is not a no unless, this is a yes unless. So if you don't do anything in terms of authorization or authentication checks, the framework will just serve your endpoint. While it's very easy to add a check to such a view using a decorator or something else, if you forget that, then you're falling back to the default case of allowing that uh, endpoint to be reached. Now you're probably thinking, I'm not going to screw up, I'm going to do this right, I'm not going to miss that decorator. And yet, in a lot of the projects that I've reviewed, Somewhere down the line, someone forgot. 
Someone did a bit of refactoring, messed with the classes, and suddenly the, uh, the, the, the authorization mix-in disappeared from the parent classes. The decorator was forgotten, or they implemented a very difficult endpoint, uh, uh, grabbing all kinds of documents from different locations, zipping them and serving them. They were so focused on the business logic that they forgot about adding the decorator. And suddenly there was an endpoint just open for the public that shouldn't have been. So think about it. You can solve it maybe with middleware that first checks if there's a check, and if not, de just deny everything. But think about it. Deny by default, and only if you explicitly allow someone, then you should allow it. The second thing that I want to teach you today are mature security practices. But how do you know what they are? Well, luckily, here we have standards. Here we have models that can help us. Um, the problem with that is that a lot of these models are very abstract. They're very high level, they're meant for organizations, they're meant for consultants, they're meant for specialists, and they discuss it with CTOs or other C-level managers to implement organ uh, organization-wide uh, um, policies. And for us developers, it doesn't actually tell us what we should do. And maybe at the top is ISO uh, 27001, uh, which is very high level and abstract, you can get certification in that, but I as a developer, I don't really know what to do with it. Luckily, there's an organization called OWASP, the Open Worldwide Application Security Program, uh, and they have a number of maturity models that are much more suited for developers. The most famous one, one of their flagship projects, is the Software Assurance Maturity Model, or SAM, and this is already a model that can help us. And by the way, I really like OWASP because I like their logo. They're called OWASP, so they have a WASP inside of an O. I think it's amazing. Um, anyway, so if you have this model, one of the, the, the maturity activities that you can do within the secure build uh, pillar of the model is that you can create a formal definition of your build process so that it becomes consistent and repeatable. This is already much closer to what we developers do. But it still doesn't tell me how I can accomplish that. So there's another model also by OWASP. It's the OWASP DevSecOps maturity model. Uh, it's still a lab project, it's fairly new, it's still being worked on actively, but I think this is much closer to what we as developers experience. So if you now look at something in the build part of uh, the DSUM model, there's pinning of artifacts. Um, and artifacts uh, may be a term that you're not that familiar with. You may, it's maybe a term that you are really familiar with. You do have to learn the language of the security specialists a little bit. But say that you're doing a build and you have all these kinds of dependencies that you're including in your build, and then it's a good idea to pin their versions, so pin your dependencies. And so you can already see there's kind of a mapping between the two layers, and the top one splits out into various security activities within the DESA model. And this is something that we can just do. We can just take the model and do this in our own projects. By the way, I do have to mention, I've adapted this sheet with some modifications. All the errors are mine from Tima Pagel. I asked him if I could do it. I got the permission. He's the lead of the DESA model. So what is the DESA model? Um, the DESA model is something that, as developers, we're probably uh, recognized. It's a number of dimensions. All of those dimensions split up into various sub-dimensions. Uh, and within those sub-dimensions, that's where it gets interesting. So if you look at patch management, for instance, there are just security activities that we as developers uh, uh, can implement. So what I would like to, to urge upon you is to check out this maturity model, dive into the security activities that it has, and you see what are we doing, what can we improve, and one piece of advice, do look into what all these terms mean. Uh, because security specialists sometimes use terms that are very similar to how developers use them, but the domains don't map one-to-one. -one. So you really have to map the language uh, 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 upon each other to understand what they mean. I think that is the most important thing that I want to tell you today. I also had a bit about uh, threat modeling. Check it out, something that you should do, but it's fairly difficult but it's uh, certainly worth it. And I think vulnerabilities, you all know how to handle it. Look up the lists, they're all there. Just don't stop there, dive into them. Find some kind of game like Capture the Flag where you can uh, experiment with actually uh, penetrating those vulnerabilities so you understand them. And look up standardized techniques and mitigations for them. Don't invent your own security. For all of these common vulnerabilities, there are standard ways of handling them. Uh, and I think 
That's the most important part. Closing remarks, take it slow. You cannot go from zero to 100% overnight. If you suddenly install 20 security scanners, you're going to get 800 alerts. And the only thing that you're going to do is to make everyone ignore all those, all those alerts. That's not a good policy. Take it slow, one step at a time. You don't have to go from zero to 100. Be pragmatic. You can spend months, years on security for a project, but you still have to deliver it. So you have to make that risk-benefit analysis. Uh, it's really important. And be vocal. If you want to improve the security culture, you have to tell others about it. And that's really important. Now, by the way, I'm also one of the organizers of EuroPython this year in Prague. If you want to go there, you should definitely check it out. If you have a company and some money, uh, some money left, the, the sponsorship is going a little bit slow this year. We are a nonprofit, so we could use some more support. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I was, my name was Sebastian, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thanks, Sebastian. Are there questions from the room? Hmm, Going no once. Questions. Well, <laughs> I, I have a question. Uh, I liked uh, your discussion about the, the principles, and you said, well, your favorite was no unless. You had some good examples. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a second best principle and maybe an example? Do I have a second best principle and maybe an example? Um, I think. Uh, uh, um, there are actually two I'm kind of debating with myself. I think uh, um, a lot of people misunderstand the term that you should reduce your attack surface. So if you, uh, that, that's a, a very important term in security, reduce your attack surface. And it really means that you should make sure that there's nothing unnecessary in your applications that could be vulnerable. So if you're building a Docker container, uh, if you're making an image to, to run Docker containers from, make sure that that image only includes what you need to run the application in production. If you use a full distro, which is probably overkill, there are a lot of tools in there. And some of those tools may be vulnerable. So why don't you use a multi-stage Docker build, where you first build your application, all the build tools are in there, and then you just copy the build artifacts to your uh, production layer or to your production stage. And then you have a very lean image, which we like, very lean, very small, but there's also nothing in there that uh, has additional vulnerabilities that doesn't need to be in there. So be wary of that. And obviously this is just a very specific example, but you can consider it in everything that you do. Don't just include things that you don't uh, need. And if I can sneak in the other, don't just trust base images, base dependencies. There are a lot of supply chain attacks these days. Anyone can publish a Docker image. Oh, this one's handy, it has Python and NPM in it. Let's use it. Do you really know what's in it? Probably not, don't use it. Oh, this is a handy package from uh, PyPI. Just type in the name. Maybe you've got the name wrong. There are a lot of fake packages out there these days that have a Bitcoin miner in them or a backdoor or another kind of scanner. Don't trust those dependencies. Those are the two that I really think are important. Awesome Thanks. Tips. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Sebastian.